There we go. Okay. Any, do, wave at me if you recognize that, where that is. That, I grew up with that. Uh, St. Anne, where'd that come from? Well done, Ken. Oh, and Alan Brown. St. Anne's Cathedral. Uh, I was a choir boy there, so we used to play there before choir practice and after. It was the best place for hide and seek. And uh, Unfortunately, skateboards hadn't been invented at the time because it would have been magnificent for that as well. When you come in the great big doors off Donegal Street, uh, that's the first thing you see. There's a great big thing just below this in the tiles. Uh, and the aisle. and it doesn't matter, there are two other doors. There's one of these at all three doors. There's no way to avoid it. And the message, there was a message in it. It isn't just fancy tiling. It's a labyrinth or a maze. And we used to love to do it when we were this height. Because if you start on the black tile at the bottom here, you can even see it from there. No matter where you go, you run into a cul-de-sac. If you get on the white tile and follow it, you can't see all of it there but it will eventually take you up the aisle. So the message was choose your path. Yeah, because one path will take you nowhere and the other path will take you everywhere. It's very simple, isn't it? It's just a gospel message built into the very floor of the building. Now, I suspect most of us, and I'm exactly the same, we walk around church buildings and we walk around all sorts of places and hardly ever see any of these things that people have prayed over, thought about, put into place, spent huge amounts of money, uh, anguished over them and put them in, hoping that in future generations they would see it, understand it. Now, so it's that sort of thing, and that's why we have some of these images here today. Let me uh, take you to this little picture. Um, there's a, He was the Archbishop of York, but went on to... Uh, be, um, no, he's the Bishop of Durham, sorry, I can't get that right, and now teaches theology in a Scottish university. And he said that there's a fine balance required in our understanding of God. And he said, most of us live in an imbalanced version of it. And this was uh, what he said, we have reduced the good news of Jesus Christ to three things. My private piety and what my private piety means is my lifestyle. So Jesus came to tell me not to use bad language and not go to the pictures and not go dancing and all those sorts of things, that we've reduced the message of Jesus to it's about me and my life, or it's about the cross. And the cross has become my comfort for my conscience. So when I know I do something wrong, I can ask God to forgive me, and it's washed clean. And Easter has been reduced to the guaranteed happy ending to my story. And Tom Wright says, there's another, there's a balance to that. Those things are all true. It is about my lifestyle. It is about the forgiveness of my sin. And it is about my eternal future. But it's about a whole lot more than that as well. There's a balance here. So let me read to you a paragraph something he said, and it goes with this picture. The Gospels are asking us to see the story of Jesus as a huge theological balancing act. Imagine the great pyramids in Egypt. When you get up close, they're not just big, they are massive. They tower over you, solid and vast. The individual stones each weigh over two tons, since there are over two million of the stones in the largest of the pyramids, that's that one, the combined weight must be nearly six million tons. Now imagine a truly enormous giant picking up one of those pyramids and turning it upside down so that all that scary weight now rests on one point. The Gospels are about that one point. The whole pyramid of created life, from the physical universe itself down to the smallest creature, with human beings, vulnerable, muddled, sinful, and sorrowing, caught up in the middle of it all. That whole pyramid is now balanced on this one story and this one person. This is what the Creator's love looks like in action. Jesus himself, 
the ultimate human being, vulnerable, sorrowing, yet poised and balanced, gives himself as an embodiment of the Creator's love. The whole of the gospel stories, the whole of the created order, the whole of history, the whole of our lives, the whole of our globe, the whole of everything is balanced on one person. So that's part of the balance to the gospel of being about me and what I need and my future. It's the whole of everything balanced on one person. Let me take you back to that picture. Uh, see if I can capture what you're looking at here. You see this building that we're sitting in, right? It would be reasonable to say there was thought went into this. Yeah? It's not just an accident. And I know, uh, and somebody down the back could shout at me if I get any of these facts wrong. <laughs> okay? After the bomb, these windows became clear. Would that be right? So you could see out? Yes? Nod at me or... Well, sure, let's just say that. But it doesn't matter how they came into being. We have windows that you look out through and you look in through. So where I'm standing, I can see the Cave Hill and Divis. And if the Methodist roof wasn't there, I could see the whole of the city probably. Wherever you're sitting, you're probably looking out at the trees, the gardens the dual carriageway. Some of you can probably see Tesco. Some of you can see the offices across the road. There's a sense in this building, a deliberate sense, I think, that the outside and the inside are connected. When you gather in this place, it's not like in the St. Anne's Cathedral, and it has other reasons for being that way. These aren't criticisms of other places, that the outside is closed off from you. In this place, the outside remains, and we br it's almost like we bring it with us. We bring it in with us, and when somebody arrives late, we can see them. Okay. It's all out there. Their sin is obvious to all. <laughs> and there was somebody, oh, let me think back. I'm not going to embarrass anybody in the room, I don't think. Um, there, was a, there was somebody slipped out, uh, not recently, a long time ago, uh, slipped out uh, during a funeral to have a wee quick cigarette just outside the window there. And it was okay because we were all singing at the time. But then we all sat down, <laughs> okay, and somebody was standing looking in the window with their cigarette in their hand. Now, that's, that, we're not claiming that's a sin of any kind at all, but it was just really embarrassing uh, because it slipped out. <laughs> okay. So the outside and the inside connect in this building. And that's very important to us because we believe in that theologically, that we're not hiding, we're not locked away. But as you come from the light and the windows, everything starts to narrow, doesn't it, in this particular building? And I'm trying to suggest that the big jumper is a significant part of that, that as it, as it draws us to a point here, that we have to come past the idea of the father, well, it was Chris's mother's uh, what was his phrase? The literal, wasn't it? Dictionary definition of a mother's love was to build a jump, was to knit a jumper that he would always be growing into. So there's something of God the Father, the parents' love for us is inviting us to grow, to become. And at this side, coming past the wee bowl that recognizes and doesn't try to hide our brokenness and our shame and our fears but allows them to be melted into the beauty of what God's trying to create. So we come in bringing the outside with us, and we come past these great truths, and I'm going to try to be Trinitarian and say, this represents the Father's heart, and this represents the activity of the Spirit in molding us and shaping us. But yet, it continues to push us inwards, and we come to this place where I'm standing, and it isn't all about technology, uh, but it's about worship, and about music, and in a previous world, there was a, a, a wooden lectern that was officially the prayer desk where the prayers and the Bible are read, and the other lectern where the word is preached, and these are the discipleship um, activities of the church of God, God's word, the prayer, the worship, the joining together, but yet it continues to push us inwards. 
don't want to fall over anything, continues to push us inwards, and it's pushing us towards this table. This table that carries and then gives out the symbols of Jesus' body and blood broken and shed for us as we sit around that table. And one day we'll be doing that again. But it continues to push us inwards. And like any volcano, as the pressure builds and the pressure builds, it eventually erupts to this. It's a stained glass window. And it's not holy in that sense that it's, it's something that carries mystical power or anything with it. But it is an image and a picture. Do you know the difference between an icon and an idol? An idol is the thing you worship. An icon is a picture of the thing you worship. This is an icon. And the outside, the images of Father and Spirit, the gathering as God's people to join in the activities of God's people gathered around Jesus' table eventually explodes us to the person of Christ. And that's what Tom Wright was writing about. This is the one on whom everything rests. This is the balance to the gospel that's about me, to the gospel that's about our world, the gospel that's about God and about Jesus and about the transcendence of Jesus. Do you see in the picture here uh, the two people just below Jesus? This is the transfiguration. We are the church of the transfiguration. Um, that's Moses and Elijah representing the law. Moses, Sinai, the Ten Commandments, all the law in Deuteronomy. Uh, Elijah, one of the greatest of the prophets, the living presence of God in the, that living word among God's people in the Old Testament. Jesus is above all of that. Yeah? In a sense, he holds it together. Down here at the bottom, the three disciples at the bottom of this picture representing us, the church, the people of the world. Jesus greater than all of that. Standing over all of it. Could I take you somewhere uh, in the New Testament to the letter to the Colossians and you're looking at that and thinking, well, never read that. Uh, well, I don't want you to read it. I just want you to see the, the text uh, on this page because you'll notice it's not all the same. And that's because in the Bible, every now and again, there are things that are uh, not just text or prose like all the other bits. There are bits that are songs or poems or creeds that people would have learnt off by heart and repeated when they gathered together or sang together. And you'll know some of these. There's whole books of them, the Psalms, for example. But in the, New, in the New Testament, there aren't very many of them, but there are a few. And you already know some of them. One of them is Mary's song, My Soul Magnifies the Lord. You've probably sung that many times. Uh, another one is Simeon's song, Lord, now let us die thy servant, depart in peace. You would know that. And when you get, if you're reading the it depends on the translation of the Bible or the editors who put the pages together. But some of them don't recognize these, but others do recognize that there was something going on. So in this particular photograph that I took of the Bible, there's a poem in the middle of Colossians 1. And it might not be a poem. It might be a song. Although I've never seen this one uh, turned into music. Or it might be a creed that they repeated when they gathered together. Whatever it is, Paul, when he wrote to the Christians at Colossae, um, included this to describe Jesus Christ. So I'm going to make it bigger. Just the poem bit, okay? Just the poem bit. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Right. The pyramid is balanced on Jesus. 
Let's go on. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Let me take you back. Second line, he's the firstborn over all creation, right? All of creation, all of life flows out of Jesus Christ, although you need to take Jesus off that because that was when he was born as a human. He becomes Jesus. But he is the, the second person of the Trinity, the Word as John describes it in John 1, the Word who became flesh. Everything is born out of him. It's like he's the source of it all. And look what is declared of him after the resurrection in the fourth line. He's the firstborn, the same word, from among the dead. Do you see that tomb picture? We've used this at Easter for a few years now. Um, All of life, for all time, has had to pass through that door from the other side and ends up in the darkness of death until that Easter Sunday morning. And the one who was lying on that shelf there with that cloth wrapped around him burst out of death and burst out through that stone over that door. He's the firstborn from among the dead. From that moment, we all still pass through that door. And then we pass back out through it. He's the firstborn of a new order that he created. That's why that whole pyramid rests on him. Because he has created a new order that flows from the resurrection that will result in a new heaven and a new earth, a new creation in which we will find ourselves. And everything else that has walked back out through that door, out of death and into new life. It's no wonder the whole thing is balanced on him. And it finishes, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Everything in this building pushes us this way, catches our attention and draws us this way until we end up He is what it is all about. He is the one we turn to. On Thursday, he is the one we're going to ask, would you walk a step ahead of us so that we don't get in front of you? It's all about him and what he wants to do in his world, how he's affecting his world, how his heart is broken by the news that we hear in our world. And how he inspires his church, people like you and me, to make a difference in the world. Because you see, it isn't all about me and about my sin, but it's about what I'm going to do with God's world. How I'm going to bring hope and life to the people of the world. How I'm going to bring restoration and redemption to even the nature of our world. How we're going to bring God's light into the darkness of our world. Could I take you to another uh, place in the New Testament where there's another poem? And this is in Philippians chapter 2. And uh, this one captures something. And again, you can't see that, I'm sure. So let me make it just a little bit bigger uh, so you can see some of the words. And I want you to grasp something here before I read it to you. The second line, or the first line, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then this poem is a description of Christ Jesus who being in very nature, God. It's that word nature. It means in his very substance, right? In the very being of who he is, both character, mind, heart, but in the very substance of what it means to be a person, that Christ Jesus 
is God. And then it goes on, but didn't consider equality with God something to be held onto, but rather he emptied himself by taking the very nature, substance of a servant being made in human likeness. So the one who was in his very substance, God, empties himself, and our libraries written on that verb, emptied. What does God have to do to take on the very substance of one of us? That's this person. The God of heaven becomes the God of earth by walking on it as one of us. This is a huge... You mustn't repeat me anywhere when I say it's almost unbelievable, isn't it? But if you can believe this, if you can grasp this with faith, this turns the pyramid upside down, doesn't it? So, let me read it to you. Have the same mind as was in Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be held on to, but rather emptied himself, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a human being. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and at earth, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And as I tried to say last week, you know you have found the authentic Savior of the world when you find one with scars. The, the, the poem, the song in Philippians 2 that I've just read to you. Um, it's the, it has, the nearest I've seen it turned into a song as the servant king. From heaven you came, helpless babe, entered our world, your glory veiled. Uh, now we aren't going to sing that today, but we are going to sing something that captures some of that. But more than anything, wouldn't it be good if our hearts were captured by these wondrous truths about God's love for us in this jumper? this wondrous ministry of the Holy Spirit in taking our brokenness and our shame and our pain and beginning to heal it and melt it together into a new beauty and then grasping it's all about Him. It's about Jesus the Christ. The Christ meaning the Messiah, the Anointed One. It's all about Him. The pyramid is tipped over. And everything is balanced on him.